Father, we want to thank you for your word. Yes, we come to your table, Lord, with a heart that is full of repentance at the same time, admiration. Repentance, it is because we know we are sinners saved by grace. And Lord, though he fall according to your word, he shall not be cast down. Full of admiration because you are the Lion of Judah. You are the Lamb of God. And your blood never loses its power from generation to generation. Moment by moment, we can come to you and draw from you that cleansing and draw from you that strength. Hallelujah! That supernatural strength that comes from above. And as we feed upon what you have done for us on the cross, like feeding upon the heavenly manner, it will give us that supernatural strength that we need. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you that the blood of Jesus able to cleanse us from all our sins. Thank you for the word of the Lord able to rebuke us, correct us, and grant us the strength to live for the Lord. We truly need the daily bread that comes from the mouth of God. So I commit your people into your hand as we hold the cup and the bread. We recognize everything that is needed for us to live this Christian life already being accomplished on the cross by the Lord Jesus when He declared that it is finished. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, and that your love, hallelujah, the the length, the breadth, the height, the depth is beyond our comprehension. Lord, help us not to keep focusing on our own faults, our mistakes, and Lord, the sins that we have committed. But rather, help us to keep our eyes upon Jesus. When you say it is finished, means it is finished. It is forgiven. It is over. We can start all over again. And Lord, we can count on you and count upon your word. For that, we are thankful because you are the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Not just an individual, but the entire world. Hallelujah. The entire universe. Amen. Amen. Just one drop of the blood of Jesus is sufficient. It's sufficient to meet the holy requirement, the standard that you have set, Heavenly Father. Amen. That you are holy. Thank you that all of us, we are under the blood of Jesus, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we will continue to move forward even as we encounter the enemy. We overcome the enemy by the blood of Jesus. And Father, right now we look to you what you have provided for us on the cross. Lord, if there are any one of us here, we need salvation. Lord, you are stretching your hand to say, welcome, welcome, hallelujah. Welcome to receive forgiveness and new life. If any one of us, we need healing. And Lord, you are stretching out your hand, Lord, to touch us because of what the Lord has done for us. By his stripes, we are healed. Amen. Whatever sickness, hallelujah from the top of our head to the tips of our toe. Oh God, within and without, we thank you that there is healing, virtue that's flowing out from the finished work of Christ. And Lord Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that we can receive that healing even right now. I want you to agree together with me. Amen. Within your heart. Amen. Open your mouth and say, I receive the healing of the Lord. I receive the divine healing of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen, Jesus. Hallelujah. And Father, we commit every one of us here into your hand. Those of us, we are encountering difficulty. Lord, trial and testing. Oh God, sometimes we are so frustrated, we are so discouraged, and we feel like giving up. But not yet, because you have got the final word. Not the trial, not the testing, not the demanding circumstances, not the people around us. Oh God, whatever they say, even if they have given up on us, but you will never ever give up on us because you love us. Lord, Calvary will never, ever be in vain. The work of Calvary will never, ever be in vain. Hallelujah. And Lord, we will rise again wherever we are. Hallelujah. We will rise again with the help of the Lord. Amen. As as an eagle. Hallelujah. We will mount up with wings as an eagle as we wait upon you, call upon you. So I commit all my brothers and sisters here into your hand. I thank you, Father, that this morning you have given us a graphic picture and that all of us, we can mount up with wings as an eagle. Hallelujah. Wherever we are. Amen. 
And Lord, whatever we are encountering, whatever kind of a storm, Lord, as we wait upon you, call upon you, and Lord, depend on you, hallelujah, we will be like an eagle. We are able to mount up with wing as an eagle. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for the breakthrough in the broken marriage and relationship and family problem. Thank you for the breakthrough, Lord, in terms of the job and the career. Thank you for the breakthrough in terms of the ministry and serving you in the local church. Thank you for the breakthrough in our personal walk with you. Father, we thank you, we praise you as we partake of the cup and the bread. May you bless, Lord, uh, this covenant that you have instituted and that you love us as we hold the cup and the bread. Lord, we are drawing your attention to each one of us and each one of our hearts. Yes, because Lord, this covenant is very, very close to your heart. It is very close to you. And you have said, Lord, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, in remembering you, you are also mindful of us. So your eyes are upon actually every individual here. You hear their cry. You understand them. And Lord, you will continue to lift them up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for the victory you have given to us in every aspect. Amen. There is a breakthrough. There is a breakthrough. There is a breakthrough like the sun is rising. Hallelujah. There is a breakthrough over every form of darkness. Hallelujah. That enveloped your people. Thank you for the breakthrough. The breakthrough. The sun is rising. Hallelujah. The sun is rising. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The daybreak is coming. Hallelujah. Lord, bless the cup and the bread. We receive this prophetic word, Lord. Hallelujah. By faith. Thank you that all of us, Lord, will mount up our wings as an eagle. And Lord, we are heading towards the storm, but we will rise above it and we will come through it victoriously. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's partake of the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Those of you, you are taking communion online. Amen. Hallelujah. You too, as you wait upon the Lord, you will mount up with wings as an eagle above the storm. Amen. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let's partake of the cup. Shall we stand? Wonderful. As we come together to speak life, as we bless ourselves and bless one another with those life-giving declarations. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's start. I am deeply loved, greatly blessed, and highly favored. Look at somebody and say, you are deeply loved, greatly blessed, and highly favored. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Three things. Love God. Love people, love life. Amen. That is based on Acts 2 model. You know, how the early believers 
three things they do. Love God, love people, and they love life. Hallelujah. Then the third declaration, very important to each one of us. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have, and I can do what God says I can do. I know some of you, you have heard concerning the background of my personal testimony, but I need to keep you remain standing. I just take less than two minutes to just give an idea what happened. That was the year 19, I think, 89. I was young, and I was easily affected by what people said, you know. And so the devil sent people along the way, Christian especially, non-Christian, but Christian especially. They will say all kinds of everything, not directly to my face, but my name being mentioned and all that. And after that, I felt so weak inside. I feel like giving up. My feeling was, at that point, my sentiment was, so what's the point of toiling? I was young. I was in my 30s, you know. I got all the energy. I could have just ended up in FT Zyke and do something else and all that. And at the end of my retirement, probably I'll get a big fat paycheck. What for I toy? Because you understand, from the book of Numbers, Moses was constantly hearing murmuring from his people. Joshua and Caleb too. Okay, so eventually I got to understand this is part and parcel of this what dealing with people about murmuring. In front of you, they can say, you are wonderful. You know, turn their back, they can say something else. And so when you get to hear what people say, negative things about you, you felt so weak inside, so discouraged, and you want to give up. So I came to a point because I keep listening to those negative remarks. And I choose to leave the island for about one month plus. I ended up in the state. That's where Houston, God spoke to me about this. What people say about you is not important. What the circumstances say about you is not important. What even the devil say about you is not important. And the Lord says, what I said about you is more important. I am who God says, I am. I have what God says, I have. And I can do what God says, I can do. I like a battery that was flat. But when I returned to Penang, it was like a battery that is fully charged. You know, it shows all the positive signs. Wow, I tell you, since then, I never returned to my negative confession. No matter how I feel, no matter what I see, you know, the circumstances around me, even with my own accomplishment, let's say I fail, for example, but I continue to confess, not to bluff myself, not to have a positive thinking, because sometimes it takes a while for you to rise to the occasion, you know? failures, like what they say, is what? Stepping stones to success. So I learned to confess, I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have, and I can do what God says I can do. Even to this day, this has been a great inspiration to me, what the Lord has taught me. Amen. And you too can pick this up. I transfer all this to you. Amen. I pass on all this to you. And I want you to know that this is something very powerful that the Lord has taught me. Amen. Just like what the Bible says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. So collectively, let's raise our hand and declare, I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. And I can do what God says I can do. Look at somebody and say, you are who God says you are. You have what God says you have. And you can do what God says you can do. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. You may be seated. This morning, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. They are all together, 18 verses. So I'm going to start reading from verse 1 all the way. Okay. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, 
like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of the defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarn you and testify. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, we who reject this does not reject men, but God, who has given us His Holy Spirit. Verse 9, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourself are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, and that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. Verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is ever so alike. Your word is ever able to point us the right direction in the world of confusion, in the world that is full of darkness. But we want to thank you and that your word, Lord, is like a lamb onto our feet, light onto our path as a believer. Lord, as we walk in the light of your word, we walk in your confidence, we walk in your provision, we walk in the victory that you have so ordained for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Finally then, that means to say, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, he has said a lot of things. And then finally he says, Look, something is very important, I need to remind you. What are the things that's very important? There are three things in First Thessalonians chapter 4, very, very important. The first one is to abstain. The second one is to love. The third one is to hope. So let's begin by looking at the first one, to abstain. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. When a person speaks to you and says that we urge and exhort, that means to say they are going all out to encourage you, they are giving you that kind of a positive affirmation. And they are saying that we urge and exhort you in the Lord. We are telling you that you can do it and we are telling you that it is not impossible. You can achieve that. In fact, you can increase, do more and more of this. What is it that Paul wants them to do more and more? What is it that Paul saw in them and that Paul approved and says that, hey, keep doing it. In fact, don't just keep it, do it. You know, do it more and more. It's just like, you know, the Chinese has got a word when we want to encourage others, we say what? At all. Jayo, jayo. You know, you are doing very well. Do it. Come on. Go for it. Come on. Double up your effort. You know, jayo, jayo. You know, at, of course, English translation is too direct. Like, at all. <laughs> What's the meaning of at all? <laughs> that means to say is that, you know, don't stop. You know, so Paul is saying that be about more and more. Just as you receive from us and you have watched how we walk with God. Christians are not asked to just walk with men, but also learn to walk with God. Do you recognize that, you know, that God has set you apart, called you, saved you, and that He wants you to walk with Him? And that's the reason why you need to constantly have the conversation with Him so that He will tell you, He will speak to you. So many times we think that we are alone on our own as far as Christian walk is concerned. You know, and God is somewhere up there. No, Paul says that you ought to walk with God. Come on, we ought to walk with God. When you walk with someone, you get to know the person. You interact with that person and you value the opinion of that person and you want to have a close relationship with that person, you know. So Paul is saying that walk with God. But the world would want us to walk with Hollywood. 
the world will want us to walk with, you know, what else, you know, drinking, smoking, marijuana, you name it, uh, fashion, branded goods, and the world is dangling all this before us and make us like we want to walk with all this branded stuff and there's nothing wrong. But primarily, listen, uh, primarily as a child of God, we need to learn to walk with Him. As you pursue your career, walk with God. As you pursue your higher education, walk with God first. As you pursue to get settled down, want to know, let's say, you know, potential spouse, you walk with God. To start with, your Christian life, you must learn to walk with God. And Paul says, walk with God more and more. I know you are saying the how to begin with. Well, be like Paul. Paul learned to walk with God from the very beginning when he got converted. He asked this question when he fell down from the horse. What is it? Because he saw the heavenly vision. He was actually on his way to go and persecute the Christian. But instead, he fell from the horse and then he realized that, oh, oh, it has to be God that brought him down. So now the next thing is, instead of going all out to persecute the Christian, you know, now he is asking the question, what is it? He asked God and the Lord spoke to him, you know, and tell him that you are to live for me, you are to preach for me, you are to suffer for me, you are to be my servant. So he learned from that point onwards, never turning back. He learned to walk with God. You and I, we need to ask this question. Hey, where are you going? You know, the year 2022, it's already in the month of August. And some of us, we're still drifting along. We're still going along. Soon, it will be for Malaysian eh? Autumn Festival, Mooncake. Soon, it will be somewhere October, getting ready for Christmas. And soon, it will be, hello, Chinese New Year is about seven months away. I think I'm right. August, September, October, November, December, January, February. Six months away. And uh, uh, after Chinese New Year, then you'll be another Valentine. Time flies. You understand or not? You better pause because you're just going nowhere here, there, everywhere and all that. And some, some of you are probably standing still. Why? Because you have not learned to walk with God. You need to learn to walk with God and ask the question, Lord, what is it? And Lord, I'm willing to walk with you all the way. That's why Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So many of us, we think that that verse is for new convert or unbelievers. No, that verse, Jesus is referring to every of his disciples. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And when you walk with God, you will be able to find the way, the truth, and the life. You don't just want to walk with God. Paul says more and more, you ought to learn to please God. I don't know about you, but I was brought up to be very obedient and also feel a piety. And also, I was very eager to comply. My background was, I love to comply. When I'm in school, so... When the form teacher explained, these are the things that you've got to do, I'll be the first one in my heart says, I'll do it. You know, when I end up as a prefect, and then those who are senior, they say that as a prefect, you could do like that, like that, like that, you carry out your duty, and this, and I, I'm willing to comply. So when I join anywhere, or whatever, even in recreation or in music department, I'm willing to comply. I'm pretty a, quite a compliant person. Also, along with that, Meaning to say, I'm quite a man pleaser. You know what I'm talking about? That I want to please people, okay? Not so much of to please people, to take advantage of people, but more of to please people so that I will not offend people and I value what they said and I want their friendship and all that. So more of very compliance and a man pleaser. After I became a Christian, I got very frustrated because you know why? Constantly I'm put in that position. No longer I'm able to please people. I can't please my parents all the time because of food offered to idols. In school, I can't please my friends because you know why? They were into pornography and such. You know, when I'm working outside for a while and I couldn't please my superior as well as my colleague 
because they speak all the vulgar words and all the dirty jokes and, and all that. And so I got very, very frustrated when I joined church and then when I start serving and I realized that, wow, I didn't know. I mean, even in the youth department, so-and-so has got such a fiery temple. So-and-so has got such a petty mindset. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, so I'm trying to please this person with a fiery temple with a smile. Okay? And then at the same time, I try to also please this person with a very petty mindset. Very petty. Petty over when reading the minutes, for example, if there is this present perfect tense, but it's wrong, it has to be past tense. Wow, there was this flare up and all that. So I, I just wins and uh, nothing to do with me, but because I'm part of the group and I was trying to do like, <laughs> to the very petty person and then to the very fiery temple, <laughs> But in my heart, I got very frustrated because I'm trying to please everybody, you know, not even thinking about myself. So one day I got very frustrated. I went to the Lord in prayer. And that's where I saw this verse, Galatians 1.10. Galatians 1.10, it says, For I do not persuade men or God. Do I seek to please men? Then it says, For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. What does that mean? If you are a man pleaser, then you are not fit to be a servant of the Lord. Then I realized this one thing. Don't have to please anyone. Just please the Lord. And when you please the Lord, you actually you please everyone. Why? Because when you please the Lord, you actually please your parents. The Lord says that honor your father and your mother. When you please the Lord, you're actually pleasing everybody. Because the word of the Lord says what? Love one another. You don't have to try to put on the face, smiling and making people happy and all that. Just please the Lord. When you please the Lord, you will not judge the person who is very petty. You will not make negative remarks. When you please the Lord, you will not speak to that person with a fiery temple in such a harsh manner. Because you want to please the Lord, so you just do the right thing. You know? And so, then I realized this one thing. A lot easier, listen, to please one person than to please a dozen of people. You know, in every situation, it's a lot easier to please one person. And that person, my choice is Jesus. And so Paul is saying to the Thessalonian Christian, learn to walk with God. Church, for the rest of 2022, all the way until December, start walking with Jesus. Wake up in the morning, pray, learn to hear Him, okay? At the same time, read His Word and let Him speak to you. At the same time, you know, carry out whatever conviction that He placed upon your heart. Learn to walk with Him, not just once only, but moment by moment, walking with Him and learning to please Him. So Paul says, look, I saw these two positive qualities in you that you are walking with God and you have learned to please God. Now, let it be about more and more and more and more. Stay away from being a man pleaser. Next, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you shall abstain from sexual immorality. What's the meaning of sanctification? Can I have the meaning of the sanctification? The action of making or deciding something holy. The sanctification of bread and wine into the body and the blood of Jesus. The action or process of being free from sins or purified. Okay? It says that the process of sanctification takes deliberate actions on our part. Sanctification. That means to say God is declaring that as far as your position is concerned, you are holy. But the process is called sanctification. You know, one step at a time, one day at a time. For this is the will of God, Paul says, your sanctification for the sake of your status and that God has already set you apart. He declared that you are holy. You should abstain from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality does not just hurt married people. It also hurt the single adult. So we have to take heed of what the Bible has got to say, okay? Now, God created the heaven and the earth. Six days, right? Let's have the picture. Seven days of creation, 
but God rested on the seven days. But six days, he created the heaven and the earth. Let me have the picture, the next one. Okay, and then he created man on the six days. And this is what he says. Genesis, just leave the picture there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Okay, God says that, you know, I will create Eve for Adam to take away that loneliness. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, leave the picture there. Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The union, referring to the union. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says that, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. The biological part, you know, replenishing the earth. Now let's have the next picture, Adam and Eve, I think so. Right. So God created heaven and earth, and God created Adam and Eve. You know, sex is created by God. It's meant to meet the loneliness of an individual within the context of marriage. Sex is created by God. The two shall become one flesh, the male and the female. Sex is created by God for procreation as well. Okay? Not just for pleasure, but for procreation. And so we see that it is God who created sex. It is not the devil. But anything that good can be abused. You know, and so men, they are the one that abuse it. I'm saying human being. I'm not referring to gender. It can be both male or female. But the Bible tells us to watch out, to look out, that we should abstain from sexual immorality, both male and female. Okay? Why? That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctifications and honor. Know that God has already declared that you are holy. Therefore, you need to know how to exercise self-control, know your worth in the eyes of God, okay? And that you ought to be holy. And so in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Okay, listen here. The story concerning Joseph and Potiphar's wife, let me have the picture, that is found in Genesis chapter 39, I think. It says that, but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work. Joseph. He was actually, you know, very conscientious. He went into the house to do his work. But none of the men of the house was inside. Uh -uh. So it is the lady that initiated. That she caught him by his garment and saying, lie with me. That means have sex with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Joseph, in an example, he's a perfect example concerning how to possess his vessel and that he learned to flee. Okay? Now, there's another guy that is found in Judges chapter 16, verse 1 to verse 2. Samson. Let me have the picture of Samson. Samson, from birth, he was called by God. No wine, no razor, and then uh, don't touch anything that is dead because that's called a Nazarite vow, set apart for God. That means already declared, even when he was born, supposed to be holy. So he has to carry himself with the hallmark that I have got this Nazarite vow that God has set me apart and that his supernatural strength is upon me. Unfortunately. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there. What's the meaning of harlot in English? Prostitute. Okay? That means she was a professional prostitute. Uh, she has got many, many relationships with men. I'm just trying to put it a little bit more graphic. Not about the action, but her experience. Probably she has slept every day with at least five men. So she has gone through many, many rounds of this. And to her, it's like, you know, numb. But Samson saw her, knowing that she's a prostitute, and he is a holy vessel, went in to her. So the Bible tells us in verse 2, when the Gazites were told, Samson has come here. They surrounded the place where they lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it is daytime, we will kill him. 
the indication is from this side of the angle you look at it, meaning to say Samson didn't just go there and patronize for about 45 minutes or one hour. It is an all-night affair, okay? So he was there. And the result, you know, because he dishonored the vessel, the very body that God has given to him. And it's more than just the body, the dedications, the vow, the life. His eyes was gorged out. But God was merciful that allowed him one last time. He was able to rock the pillar and brought the house down and kill many of the enemies. But what a sad ending. But as far as Joseph is concerned, his ending was different. He knows how to possess his vessel, he himself. The Bible says that when he died, he told his descendants, don't leave my bones in Egypt, but take me back to where my parents, grandparents, that's where they came from, the promised land. And they honor his word. They honor his word by taking him back. Totally two different picture. That's what immorality can do to your life. Listen here. There are three places. Hello? Very dangerous when it comes to sexual activities. That it will surprise you. The first one, the working place. Because now, a lot of people, they have to go for trips, you know? And sometimes they can end up, the company just send a man and a woman. And over months and years, they can develop a special relationship. Not in the context of Christian, non-Christian. I'm talking about that closeness. The second place is a very dangerous place that can foster immorality online. Nowadays, it's very easy. From laptop to handphone, you can see, you can watch anything. You know, once you arouse that desire, listen, desire that arouse, whether it's male or female, you need an outlet. You understand? You need to get over it. The only way is then you cross the line. You cross the line. So online, it's a very dangerous place. I'm not saying that you stop using online, but you have to understand the workplace online, these are very dangerous places. Okay, the devil is using that as a bait, especially, you know, to bring in, to bring in victims. It can be Christian, non-Christian. Christians are supposed to be fortified, and yet they fall. Why? Because they feed their mind, their heart, their soul, their spirit too much with this pornographic material, so much so that when they are so aroused, Paul talk about burn. Inside you is burning. You need to get this heat out. How? And you compromise. Finish. The third place that is more dangerous about sexual immorality is the church. And sometimes it's because we have got programs and all that, you know. It's okay for the counselee to meet the counsellor. The counsellor happens to be a female. The counsellor happens to be a male. They are met often and all that. And when they have compassion, exchange and all that, and listen to all the soft, soft story. And then when the counsellor was specially nice to the counsellor, the lady, and the counsellor happens to have got a void in the heart, in the marriage life, husband is not so gentleman and all that. And then all rationale is thrown out of the mind. And then they become intimate. You know, as far as feeling is concerned. And the next step is immorality. Church is the place. You won't believe that. There's a pasture. Because it's in the internet, so I'm not bad-mouthing. Okay? And everybody is watching that. But I'm just trying to use that to illustrate the church is a dangerous place. So we have to really lay down the do and the don'ts. That's why, as far as I'm concerned, I always tell the female staff, don't counsel another male, brothers, you know. But if you have to, then two person, a male staff and a female staff. Then you attend to it. After that, you just delegate it to the male staff. You don't get involved. You move away, okay? It is out of necessity that you have to talk to this man, okay? Let's have the pictures of Carl Lenz. You know about this famous pastor? Okay, in New York. You know who used to attend his church? Justin, that is a very famous 
Christian singer. He was not, but he got converted. So he personally mentored all the celebrities. Plus Justin's former girlfriend, I think it's called Selena. But of course, Justin is not together with Selena, but they were attending his church. But in the end, he fell with an outsider, a non-Christian, through online. It can happen to church people. Imagine a pastor from a very big church in New York, and it's attached to Hillsong. Hillsong, you know? So, the Bible simply tells us this, that we must know how to possess our own vessel, go back to the Word, in sanctifications and honour. Okay? Be clear-minded about this, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no one should take advantage and defraud his brother in this matter. Okay? We've got to make sure that we must not cross the line. Another thing about the church is, sometimes I have reservation to say this, but really, I think sometimes I just have to say it. Summertime, some of the girls like to wear spaghetti. Is it wrong to wear spaghetti? No. Wear it at home. You know what I'm talking about? And if you have to wear spaghetti, wear it in the park. But why must you come for two hours service, one and a half hours, and then you wear spaghetti? You wouldn't know what the men are thinking. Those are seated right behind you. When you look at your back, you don't know what kind of a mind they have. The pastor is preaching, but they get so distracted. Oh, come on. You know, there was this church in Kuala Lumpur. So as pastors, we discussed about how to discourage the girls, the young girls, wearing spaghetti to church. You know, they have got a way, you know how? Turn on the aircon. Make sure it is very, very full, full blast, until she can't stand it. Those wear spaghetti because it's so cold. Then what do they provide? Shaw. You see, on one hand, they create a situation. On the other hand, they have got shawl to stand by. And when the girls are so cold, the ushers, the lady usher will offer the shawl for them to just wrap over. They learn a lesson. Next Sunday, come to church, don't wear spaghetti. Or at least bring along a jacket. Okay? So, anyway, you wouldn't know. You can stumble someone. Okay? So now let's move on. It says that God did not call us to uncleanness but in holiness, which is in line with 1 Peter 1.16. Let's look at 1 Peter 1.16. What does it say? Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Verse 7 says, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. So, having said that, verse 8, Therefore, he who reject this does not reject men. All that I taught you from verse 3 to verse 8, it says that when you reject this teaching, Paul says you're not rejecting man, but you're rejecting God who has also given us the Holy Spirit. Why? Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Can we have 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19? Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside his body. It's true. What does that mean? He is not talking about sexual sin is serious. Non-sexual sin is less serious. He's not talking about that. But he's talking about consequences. Say, for example, okay, if you deliberately, for example, you took an extra apple. You're supposed to take 10, but you take 11. And when you went back, you feel so bad. And that's just about it. You feel bad. And you have a choice. You're telling yourself, I must not, next time, take extra because it's not right. You know, and some of you probably will feel, I better go and return that one extra apple. Some of you will probably think that, hmm, what's so big deal? It's just an extra apple. I will see him, I will see her, the seller. I will give the extra one or two ringgit. Or some of you will say, I don't talk about it anymore. And then we just forget about it. Find where, how you handle it. I'm not approving the methods of handling, but you know what I'm talking about. Listen to my second part. So these sins that so-called you have committed is outside the body, right? But not, Paul says, 
when you commit sexual sin, whether you are single or whether you are married, the moment when you cross the line, you commit sexual sin, it happens to your body. Something happened. The guilt, the shame, the embarrassment. You know what I'm talking about? At the same time, you, you're afraid that you'll be exposed. At the same time, you're afraid that you don't know whether the person you slept with has taken a picture of you or not. And if the person has taken the picture, then you know that you're at the mercy of that person. And, and then at the same time, you feel so confused. At the same time, you don't know whether to admit that it's pleasure or you feel that it is like pain in the neck. Because now, you are at this person's mercy. And you're afraid that your husband will find out. And you're afraid that your wife will find out. You know, and a lot of complications begin to develop and you cannot sleep, you've got insomnia and you cannot focus in your work and, and you're not performing well and it's affecting you day after day, day after day. And the guy that has got a picture and saying that, come on, see me one more time or else. You weigh the situation, you know that if your husband knows about it or your wife knows about it, it's divorce. But that person says, one more time, I will not tell. So you give in. More guilt. You get what I'm talking about? And it's repeated, repeated, repeated until you feel that you're being abused. It's no longer called love. I thought it was love from the start. But now it becomes like I'm just his toy. You know, or her boy, boy. I'm, I'm at her mercy. So you get so emotionally, mentally, socially, even in your work and your marriage life is so affected. And those who are involved in immorality when they are in bed with their legitimate husband or wife or partner, they find they are not able to be themselves because something has gone wrong. So the Bible says that you sin against your own body and you are destroying your own body. And without knowing, you are destroying your own marriage. Statistic has shown I read, I pass on to you. A man has sex with a prostitute. You're actually having sex with all the men that he slept before. Without you knowing the chemical in her body and all that, that is reacting. That's what I was told. So you don't just have sex with her once, but actually, somehow, you're connected, even spiritually to all the different men, different background, different race, different culture, and all the way back. The Bible says that he who commits sexual immorality sins again his own body. To all the young men, to all the young lady, take the example of Joseph. You can be successful in your career. You can be successful in your marriage like Joseph. He chose to do this one thing. Don't fight. Flee. Sometimes this sexual temptations, you cannot fight it. You just have to run away. Get away. Get out of it. Don't say, I can withstand. Not many people could withstand. Understand that? Okay? So, the Bible tells us that, you know, even for all the adults here, stop it. Okay? Stop committing sexual immorality. He who commits sexual immorality sin against his own body at the expense of your character, at the expense of your career, at the expense of your happy family life. It's not worth it. Just for that pleasure of 40 minutes or one hour, then your entire character, career, as well as marriage, all gone. And then you have got the stigma. You're an adulterer, you know, for the rest of your life. So the Bible tells us, listen, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Can I have that verse? It says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I think it's 1 Corinthians 6, 19, right? Do you not know that your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Hallelujah. The very fact that we received communion just now, we are declaring that we are not, on, we are not our own. We belong to Him. We are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And let me hear a loud amen. Louder. Louder still. That's right. I'm telling you this. Some of you are singing, 
There are so many people who say amen. Some of them, you know, they probably participate. Never mind. Upon your amen, I take it that it is cut off. You have got a brand new start. You are under the blood of Jesus. Because we believe that even by faith you confess to agree with this, God will give you the victory. Amen? Don't look back at your past, but keep moving on. Next, a brotherly and orderly life. The Bible tells us that we are to love, to love one another. Well, the Bible taught us to love one another. How do I know? Okay, in John chapter 13, verse 34, it says that, Love one another as I have loved you. Next is, the Bible tells us in this uh, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to verse 39, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and that thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. But you're saying that, I can't love my neighbor. I'll tell you the secret why you can't love your neighbor. Why you find it so difficult to love your neighbor? Because you don't love God. When you love God with all your heart, He will give you the strength. So you need to start from the very basic. Love God. And then ask God to give you His love for your neighbors. And then you will be able to love your neighbors. So Paul is saying about this. He says that, look, love one another. Love God, love one another. And then this is what he wants them to do. Increase more and more. He saw a couple of things in their life. Their walk with God and how to please God. They have to increase that. Next is to increase more and more their love for one another. How do they increase more and more as far as their love for one another is concerned? Verse 11, that you aspire to live a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your own hands as we commanded you. It is so wrong, so wrong, so wrong, so wrong, so wrong, so wrong. You know, for people who come to church and think that they can just come to church and then church will be able to pay their expenses and all that. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 said. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says, He who does not work shall not eat. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, like what just now we read here, it says that we are to work with our own hands. It is a God-given calling. Every one of us, we have got to work with our own hands. Whether you work in a factory as a manager, or you work in a bank as a clerk, or you work as a musician, or you work as a teacher, or you, or you work as an engineer, architect, lawyer, we are to work. Paul says, work. Work in such a way that you're able to supply for your need, as well as the need of your family, so that the outside, people who are outside, when they look at you, you will lack nothing that you are well provided for because you work very hard. At the same time, you don't lack one thing, your testimony, so that you may not lack nothing. So that the people around you, they look at Christian, they say this one thing, they are hardworking people. They are able to look after their own needs. On top of that, they are able to supply the people around them if they need any help. So working, or rather, to be industrious, to work very hard, and to earn a living, it is actually God's will. Okay? The third thing that I want to highlight to you from this same chapter is hope. We have hope. What kind of a hope is that? The Bible tells us, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others have no hope. When we look around us, because of COVID, some of them, they have lost their father, some mother, some wife, husband, some, you know, Grandfather, grandmother, some son's daughter, some grandchildren. So sad. I could never forget the first victim, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe there are others, I don't know. But just allow me to say it. Last year, Chinese New Year, Brother Vincent come. I always saw him at the car park with the guitar. We always greeted one another, greeted one another, talked to each other and all that. Suddenly, he was taken away because of this COVID-19. You know, the sense of grief, the sense of loss was there. But the Bible tells us, let us not grieve as others who have no hope. There are so many in our midst here. We know those people that we are familiar with. They are not here anymore because of COVID-19. But the Bible tells us, let us not sorrow as others who have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. The word death, it's now completely taken over by the word sleep as believer. 
those of us we pass away. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming day of the Lord by no means precede those who are asleep. Wow, a preference is given to those who are asleep, those who pass away first. For the Lord himself, get ready the trumpet, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. You wonder how the trumpet sounds like? Let's have it. Okay, thank you. And so the Bible says that with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive, we will remain, we'll be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds. Can I have the picture that has got an arrow sign going up? That's right. To meet the Lord in the air. The next picture. Then those who are alive, the, that means we will be caught up. The dead in Christ go up first, but simultaneously, we will go up together. Okay, let's look at the graveyard now. We miss all of them, don't we? But there is the day of reunion. We always talk about Chinese New Year got reunion, isn't it? Huh? But I'm telling you, the day will come, we will have that reunion. Can I have the picture of Christ in the midair? That's right. You know, the date in Christ will go up first, then it followed by us. There will be that day of reunion. In conclusion, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Get ready the song, Heaven's Hymn, verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Hallelujah. You know, as a pastor of Penang Fresh, I long to meet again some of the beloved staff, as well as pastoral staff, okay, office staff, as well as some of our church members. They've been so dear to us, every one of them, you know, every one of them. And I know that there is going to be that great reunion. Hallelujah. And when we meet again, it will be a time of rejoicing. Luhobo, 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 luhobo. Just one thought only, then we'll get ready the song. Do they see us? I don't know, but the book of Hebrews seems to tell us that we are surrounded by a cloud of weaknesses. A cloud of weaknesses means they have gone before us and they look down from heaven. It's just that we don't communicate, but they saw, they are seeing us. So let us run that race, shall we? Shall we stand this, sing together these beautiful hymns? There will be a day when all will bow before Him There will be a day When death will be no more Standing face to face With Him who died and rose again Holy, holy is the Yeah.
sing the chorus a few more times. But let me just read to you the stanza. They are so meaningful. How I long to breathe the air of heaven, where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets. To look upon the one who bled to save me, and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer we pray in desperation. The songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we will see that it was worth it. When he returns to wipe away our tears, the third one, third verse, and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith, with one voice a thousand generation sing, "Worthy is the Lamb who was slain; forever he shall reign." Hallelujah! So let it be today. So, so let it be today We shall the game of heaven With angels and the saints We raise the mighty road Glory to our God Who gave us life beyond the grave Holy, holy is the benedictions upon your people hallelujah i pray father that they will abound more and more that they know how to walk with you and how to please you i pray father that they will abstain from sexual immorality i pray father that you will keep everyone here hallelujah amen from falling hallelujah whether it is in the office or whether it is online or whether it is Hallelujah. In the church. Amen. I pray, Father, that everyone will know their worth in terms of sanctification, in terms, hallelujah, of honor, and that they know how to possess themselves as a vessel. Amen. As the temple of the Holy Spirit, filled with praise and filled with power. I pray, Father, that everyone here, that they will work with their hands. Hallelujah. And that, Lord, so that there will be no lack in their life. Amen. And there are great testimony to the people outside. I pray, Father, that this is our blessed hope. Amen. Whatever that is going on around us, uh, that seems to be so bleak and death, it seems like, you know, it's just near the door all the time. Yet we have this blessed hope that one day there's going to be this great reunion. They're going to see our loved ones have gone on before us uh, face to face. Uh. But meanwhile, Lord, may you cover us with your precious blood. COVID-19 cannot touch us. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, that all of us will walk in divine favor and divine health and divine prosperity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Give the Lord a hand.